Hi, Tara. Welcome to All Hi. Over Again podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to see you. It is so great to see you. It's been a little while. It's been almost a year mm-hmm. since I saw you actually and met you live. A l- More yeah, than that? Yeah, a little over a year, I think. Yeah, a little over a year from the um, the pregnant-ish um, event that we did at SIR. A lot's happened since then. A lot has happened since then. ZZ was born. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Were you pregnant with ZZ? my little ZZ? girl in December. No, I was oh actually, I think, coming up on my transfer um, probably a few weeks after the event. And then she stopped. Wow. So I was with child probably a couple of weeks after that. <gasps> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. You drank the pregnant yeah. Kool-Aid. I did. I did. I did. I did. And I remember being there at that event and just um, knowing that my transfer was coming up and being a little terrified that it wouldn't work because I only had the one healthy embryo from my retrieval. And then we had one low level mosaic. And one of the questions that I asked one of the geneticists at that event that year was, you know, what's the news with mosaics or low level mosaics? And she said that they had a similar chance of sticking that a normal euploid, am I saying that right? Um, embryo would have. And I was like, what? So I was like, oh, cool. I might have two chances, but Luckily, ZZ stuck, so high five. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I I had a similar, obviously different, but similar situation where I had one viable embryo and mm-hmm. she stuck too. She's now five. Wow. Okay. Tara, mm-hmm. if you had the opportunity for a redo, what would you do all over again? I'm so sorry to even say it, but nothing. I really, truly believe that every experience I've had, good, bad, and indifferent, have been the most divine breadcrumb trail I've ever had to follow. And had I not gone through all of the mind-blowing and bending experiences that I went through, I would not be the daughter that I am today, the wife that I am today, the mother that I am today, or the advocate that I am today. So you know, from my trollop days to my druggy days, to my recovery days, just figuring it out, um, to my cheating days, you know, I mean, I've, I've done some, I've done, I've been a piece of work before, but, oh man, I just, I, I love who it's made me become. How mm-hmm. did becoming Miss USA change your life? Oh my gosh. Wow. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a really tiny town in Kentucky And I think we had like two or three stoplights at the time, no Starbucks, no sushi. It was a dry county, meaning they didn't sell alcohol. So (laughs) church on every corner. And when I won Miss USA, I had to move to New York City the next day. And I was in a complete culture shock. I was barely 20 years old. Um, I was a, I was a baby. I, I really was a very uncultured baby living in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. And my life went from just a very hometown country girl, um, minimal opportunity place to the sky is the limit, or maybe just the beginning. And I'm really grateful for the experience. But wow, if it it, it was the catalyst for every change in my life. And first of all, how long did you live in New York City? So when you, at the time, um, the Miss Universe organization was owned by Donald Trump and NBC and their headquarters was in um, like Midtown. So you lived there for the year and you would live there with Miss Teen USA and Miss Universe. And then it's crazy when we used to say that they pick you up in a limo and drop you off in a taxi cab because the second that your reign is over, it's like, good luck. (laughs) <laughs> and you just oh have to gosh. figure it out. You're like, w- yeah. Was that a reality TV show, by the way, living with Miss Universe and Miss Teen mm-hmm. USA? Yes. Why have so they never made a reality my, TV show out of that? They did. We did one. It was called Pageant Place on MTV. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if there's any Pageant Place fans out there, but 
after my scandal, which I'm sure we'll get into, I moved to Los Angeles and they went on with the pageant life, right? So the new Miss USA had taken over and then they're all living in New York City. But the buzz around my scandal was the most press that the past or the pageant had gotten in a very long time. So they really tried to make something out of it. And so they decided to do pageant place where I went back to New York city (laughs) to live with the girls and kind of be there as like a mentor or a manager. I'm not really sure what they were trying to do of that, um, except to make (laughs) the best out of a crap sandwich. Um, So they of course hated having me there because I got more attention than them at the time. Um, And I also was on my best behavior. So I wasn't bringing that much drama, you know, and reality TV thrives off of drama. And here I am like six months sober, just trying to do my best. And in hindsight, when I think of it, it's, um, I actually watched those episodes a few years ago and I felt so sad for the girl that I was watching because I was still very sick at the time. Like I was just bringing my head out of my ass really from my addiction and learning how to live a sober lifestyle and recovery and navigating Los Angeles and the entertainment industry and paparazzi and all of these things. So yeah, they did make a show about it. It didn't get picked up for a second season though. I don't think that we threw enough drinks. Got you. Got you. (laughs) Wow. Now I want to like find Mm -hmm. it from whatever archives it's been hidden in because I, I, when you, when you talk about the premise of the show, it seems like it would make for a really, I mean, your scandal aside, right? Like having Mm -hmm. all three of you live together would be very interesting, I would think, right? Because three well, different people from sh- different places. Mm-hmm. It, it was challenging because um, the miss, the girl that turned me in for doing drugs was Miss Teen USA at the time. And we used to party together in New York, which is a lot of fun. So it was fun when she was there in the show because she was just great, great television. Um, but she was also under 21 and then the Miss Universe that was moving forward and the new one coming in, her name was Rio Mori and she was uh, Japanese and she didn't speak like English wasn't her first language. So it was very hard navigating, um, a reality TV show, talk about feelings when you have uh, basically a 19 year old, um, uh, you know, a, this amazing, wonderful woman from Japan who is just the sweetest, kindest baby in the land who just knows how to be nothing but kind and genuine and sweet. And then, you know, the Miss USA at the time, her name uh, is Rachel Smith. She actually is a correspondent, I think, now for Entertainment Tonight, maybe. Um, but she's doing great. Uh, but she did not like having me there at the time. I was kind of may I say like the antichrist of pageantry, like she, you know, <laughs> at the time people were like, this girl needs to go. <laughs> and I don't blame oh them for feeling gosh. that way. Wait. So did you just say that the former Miss Teen USA was the one that turned you in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually a very, was- very weird story. I think we were all drinking one night at this Mexican restaurant God, where was it? It doesn't matter. But she thought I was flirting with her boyfriend, which I wasn't. Um, But I believe she was a little intoxicated. And she called the uh, president of the Miss Universe organization and was like, Tara's doing cocaine just to try to like get me, you know. (laughs) And it was pretty soon after that that I was uh, brought in to do a drug test. And um I would love to say that it was coming from a place of genuine concern, but, um, you know, thank God, you know, people, people's lives have breadcrumbs that are not always placed by angels, but they are little miracles and disguises nonetheless. So I'm grateful. I was going to ask you because at the time it must have felt really hard, but now looking Mm -hmm. back, was it a blessing in disguise? It for sure was a blessing in disguise. The whole experience was, um, going through it, I felt it was a whirlwind. I was just trying to put one foot in front of the other. And, 
I had this feeling that I was trying to prove to everyone that I wasn't the piece of shit they thought I was. Cause I truly felt that way about myself. Um, at 21 whopping years old. <laughs> um, and so I was just trying to do my best and uh, going through that as publicly as I did, you know, her intentions in turning me in was not to help me. It was to hurt me. Um, then I'm pretty sure that my, uh, positive drug test was leaked by the Miss Universe organization. Um, cause I was told by someone within the organization that they were in fact the ones that leaked the information. And then I was thrown into treatment, you know, because they do this huge, um, media tour basically, or not media tour, but they had this, it was like a two week whirlwind of, Mess USA is going to lose her title. Like Donald Trump's going to fire Tara Connor. It was just like absolutely insane. And they were licking it up, you know, like it was all press is good press for them. Right. So here I am just trying to navigate the hardest time of my life and the most humiliating part of my life and the sickest time of my life. And, you know, I have Donald Trump saying like Trump saves Miss USA they're going to love that. And telling me to like, bring on the tears. Like they eat that up on the way down to a press conference where they're announcing that I'm giving, getting a second chance. And then after I go to treatment, I was told, um, and I always reserve the right to be wrong, but I was told that he was calling up the head of the organization saying, why is she in treatment? She needs to be caught outside being photographed partying. Like you're an idiot basically. So I learned all of this information years later when I was kind of doing, um, I call it my little amends circuit when I was kind of cleaning up my act and trying to right my wrongs. And um, I got some pretty good information, but I realized that uh, despite people's motives and their actions at that time, I was very protected by something bigger and there was a greater task being put forth. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the experience and it made me who I am or part of who I am today. Um, but it was a, it was an experience. I mean, being branded as Mess USA at 20, 21, 20, mm -hmm. 21 years old, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. Yep. What did that do to your confidence? I mean, my confidence was already pretty shot um, after I won Miss USA because my grammar wasn't that great. <laughs> I had a very thick Southern accent and I was treated as though I was raised in a barn. I wasn't. I was mm -hmm. just raised in the South. You know, like people have different lingos wherever you go. Sure. And so I was already kind of like trying to prove to everyone that I deserved to be in the position that I was in. And when I went through my downfall, if you will, or my public, you know, scandal, um, yeah, they were, they spoke about me pretty terribly. This is before the stigma of addiction had been lifted a bit, you know, like nowadays, you know, if someone overdoses or goes into treatment, they get thoughts and prayers. When I went to treatment, I was like a witch at the Salem witch trials. And so I was spoken about as if I was suffering from a moral failing as opposed to a life-threatening disease. And I'm surprised that I survived it, truthfully. I mean, I don't know many people that could have gone through what I went through because at this point in time, it would be considered extreme bullying. That's so much. I mean, that is mm -hmm. so much for anyone to take, let alone a young person. I mean, we don't mm -hmm. have the ability to reason until we're 25 years old and you're thrown 100%. into this place in space that could bury most people and yeah. you persevered. That's Yeah, it was amazing. either that or die. <laughs> you know, I did I really didn't have a choice and you know, I love that you mentioned that like our prefrontal cortex which is in charge of so many so many parts of our thinking and emotional response and all of that isn't fully developed till 25, 26. And so I was still a developing child. <laughs> 
And not only that, I was a very sick child. Like today I look back and know that um, I was not a bad person trying to act good. I was a sick person that needed to get well. But even that being said, like I, it's very hard for me to watch interviews of that time because I have people like Matt Lauer being like, were you abused as a child? And um, were you raped? And, you know, just everyone was sensationalizing this story and my life was on the line. Um, I really don't believe that would be tolerated today. Um, but it did light this fire in me to become an advocate for the voiceless because all I could see was these young women and just women in general, or even men being like muzzled because they're seeing someone be shamed for a very normal and a very common disease. It's an epidemic at this point. So, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty rough, but it, I'm, I'm just grateful. I had a lot of angels protecting me at the time. Yeah. Was there a moment where you found your voice? I remember doing an interview. I actually talk about this in my Ted talk where I think it was on good morning America or one of the morning shows. The interviewer was like, do you think that you tarnish the crown? And I was just so over it at the point because <laughs> I was being, not many people get out of treatment and immediately go on a media tour to tell everyone about their experience and all the healing, what they found in themselves. And blah. Um, but I, I was just so blown away by the ignorance uh, as a society about addiction and mental illness at the time, because I, I did learn enough to strip away a lot of my shame. And I think by that time I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done caring at this point. I have literally no control over what anyone chooses to think about me. And I just, I'm just going to tell it as it is. I'm going to share authentically. I'm going to share the things people don't share. And I'm just going to be a hundred percent myself. Um, now I kind of did that prematurely because I don't believe that I really started to um, stop caring until I was in my thirties. Cause I was again, 20, 21 at this time. I turned 21 uh, a week before I got sober. So no, I turned 21 a week after I got sober. So I got sober on December 11th and my birthday is December 18th. So I'm 21 years old trying to <laughs> show everyone how well I am after 30 whole days in treatment. And who put you up to that? Who put you up to being this, you know, new reborn Miss USA? Um, I think because it was such a salacious <laughs> scandal, everyone kind of wanted to like, get that first interview or get the exclusive and there was profit to be made from that. So I, I think it was more of just the Miss Universe organization being like, all right, you're out of treatment. So now we're going to put you on Leno. We're going to put you on the Today Show. You're going to be on Dateline. We've got this lined up for you. Oh blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I, again, I'm just coming out of this whirlwind and learning about the disease that I suffer from. I hadn't healed but I had knowledge. Um, so I believe I was able to be somewhat useful at the time um, for those who were struggling with addiction and mental illness. But yeah, I mean, I still look back at that time and just kind of shake my head because ugh, just wow, the way that we treat right. people and ugh, it's awful. <laughs> like, I wouldn't wish that on how anybody. You, right. Because how could you, how could you even have been ready? I mean, we think about all of the things that people go through, right? That's a trauma. That's a trauma it of is a having trauma. to have had confront your disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to confront mm -hmm. it head on and publicly at yeah. that. And then you've got these people yeah. that are telling you, like, you have to stand up and, you know, show mm -hmm. how you are oh, making yeah. amends. Yeah, I was kind of, I went from, being mess USA to being like the poster child for recovery. And I'm being asked to like share my recovery story at 
facilities and fundraisers when I had like 30, 60 days. <laughs> I didn't, all I knew was that I had a crazy story and that I'd been sober for a, f- a couple of months. And I did stay sober. I never relapsed. I went to the Karen Treatment Center. They had an amazing program. Um, it was in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I had a lot of knowledge. Like I learned a lot about the disease, but it takes a while for the head and the heart to connect. Um, but I do find that when when people go through something so publicly, everyone just feels they have a right to your your personal experience because you're out there, right? But you can't have a private struggle anymore. I mean, if I was a Miss USA that came down with a life altering illness like cancer, people would be like, oh my God, she's so brave. But because I was coming down with alcoholism and addiction, oh my God, what a bad role model. Um, it was infuriating. And, you know, the more I've stayed sober, the more I've experienced the stigma, the more I've experienced people being shamed. Uh, it just, it continues to put me in my purpose, which I believe is to shed a light on the human condition, not just addiction, the human condition. We all experience hardships. We all go through things. We all have our experiences and stories. Um, but I think it's time we stop shaming each other. Like everyone needs to put their shame shooter away and chill out. It must've been so infuriating to have to go through that because shame and feeling shame Mm -hmm. is so heavy, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're going through all of these experiences. I'm just still in awe that you made it out alive, right? Because you were Mm -hmm. so in it And there was so much Mm -hmm. pressure and yet you maintained sobriety that blows my mind. Thank you. I mean, it was, it was pretty wild. And I think what happened afterwards was equally as wild. Like I was so popular all of a sudden because, you know, I had this crazy story and everyone's like, it was really great ammunition to give people something to talk about. But, you know, I stayed sober and I stopped, doing crazy things. And I became a well person. And then all of a sudden the paparazzi aren't following me anymore. I'm not giving them any crazy story to promote. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly mind bending when you go from being talked about and then your worth becomes how much are they talking about me in the press? And then that gets taken away. And then I realized it probably around five years sober that, oh, wow, like I'm not doing recovery for anybody else but me because nobody else cares. Like no one really truly cares. Like it was a fun, entertaining story for a lot of people for a long time. But around between like five to eight years of recovery is when I realized like, wow, I have a lot of work to do because there is a life out there to be lived and I have to find a way to live in this world without having to matter just to be a human, like a worker amongst workers and a friend amongst friends and just be a person, you know? So it, it was a roller coaster. I, I love my life now. Like being at the end of my thirties, I'm like, whew, thank God. <laughs> but there was, it was a journey. It was absolutely a journey that I don't believe many people get the chance to ride that roller coaster. And Adversity shapes us all, right? So Mm -hmm. what is something that you wish more people knew about alcohol use disorder or alcoholism? Um, Yeah, in general, I mean, I wish that people, um, I think a lot of people are starting to understand it more now because it's very rare that you meet someone that doesn't have an addict, alcoholic, or someone with a substance use disorder in their family. I mean, for years, they've been trying to do things to break the stigma. Like, don't call them an alcoholic. Like, say that you're in long-term recovery. And, you know, I am the face of all of those things. Like, I am a recovered alcoholic addict. I am a recovered trollop. I am a recovered, like, cheater. Like, I'm a recovered everything. Like, I'm a recovered smoker. Like, you know, ah. I wish people understood that our brain is no different than our liver or our heart or our lungs. It can get sick, right? If you start using 
drugs and alcohol, you're as an adolescent, which most people start using and drinking and doing all of that when they're a kid. Yeah. So when they have this still developing brain that's in rapid development and you're shooting your dopamine levels up so high that they have a neutralizing effect where they have no choice, but just shoot completely down you, your baseline just, it goes, it's all over the place. So, you know, I, I basically stunted my growth from starting drinking and using in high school to, you know, now I, have to do everything that I can just to remain normal, like neutral. Like I have to take medication. My brain chemistry is not what it used to be or, or what it should be because I mess with my dopamine levels. So it's not something that just naturally corrects. Um, there is a really uh, disheartening stigma still against people that take antidepressants or anxiety medications or what have you. It's not that these people are weak. It's not it's not a, again, a moral failing. It's just your brain gets sick sometimes. It's no different than having high cholesterol or diabetes. Like you figure it out and you treat it and it's okay. That's how it should be addressed. You figure it out, you treat it and it's okay. Keep it moving. It's a lot easier to chase personal freedom and happiness from a balanced state. So I think that I wish people had more of an open mind to treating the brain as the organ that it is. Um, and it's just, it's, there's just so many debates. I could go on in so many different directions because it's infuriating because we do have like big pharma that tries to control everything. And unfortunately, I have to take medication from big pharma to maintain my mental health. I mean, even during pregnancy, even during breastfeeding, like if I wanna be a good mom, I have to maintain my mental health I just wish that um, more people would come forward and just show that, hey, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of help and that's okay. There's no shame in that. And in fact, it's probably the most courageous thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. People really should be able to do what they need to do to maintain mm -hmm. their mental health, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether you are in your 20s or a mom or a dad, mm -hmm. quite frankly, but it, you, yeah. you need that sometimes to support mm -hmm. your well-being. And it it's so important that you say that it doesn't mean you're weak. Right. It doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It just right. is the way that it is. And it doesn't help when people pile on the shame and the, oh, well, you would well, you think it was because you did that? Or do right. you think that if you did this differently, what if you just mm -hmm. tried, you know, I mean, and, and oh, yeah, I, this conversation Girl. echoes over and over and over again with mm -hmm. alcohol use disorder, infertility, like, like, infertility. It's just like this, oh, oh right? yeah. Like I faced the stigma with alcoholism and mental illness. And then I start to go through my pregnancy journey or, you know, more so my infertility journey until it, you know, whatever. But I had, I, I hadn't been given more advice since I had my struggle with alcohol where maybe if you just, just read the book, it starts with the egg, you know, you just, you got to take these supplements or you can't even post anything on it online without someone being like, Dr. So-and-so saved my life. And I'm sitting here holding my eh, eh, eh. all the way down <laughs> to people saying, isn't it clear that God just doesn't want you to have a child? I mean, girl, when you put things out there publicly, people just, and they just bring their pitchforks and they do not hold back. It is just, it's wow. It's wow. There's no other way to explain it. And especially because you're a public figure. So they think, oh my gosh, well, you know, because she's sharing her life so publicly, I am allowed to somehow have this opinion mm -hmm. and share it. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because mm -hmm. if you were Jane Smith, mm -hmm. and no offense to Jane Smith out there, they wouldn't <laughs> yeah. necessarily be as interested in throwing the pitchforks, right? Or or maybe right. the trolls would be much less, right? Because you wouldn't have as much yeah. exposure. And it's crazy because right. they would probably not appreciate it. Number one, number two, they probably wouldn't do mm -hmm. that to anyone that was close to them. I would hope to believe that anyway. Right. And so yeah. it's crazy yeah. that people can throw daggers at strangers. I don't mm -hmm. get it. 
I don't get it either. I mean, <sighs> it is strange because there are a lot of people that, I mean, I would never speak to anyone that way. I, I'm so careful with how I speak to people. And it's not because I'm afraid I'm going to trigger everybody because I can't control everyone's triggers as well. But there's a big difference in being useful and helpful and of service and a big difference in being the life police. Um, so, you know, I would recommend anyone who's trying to give any type of nutrition device or advice, um, mental health advice, depression advice, like don't tell people to eat better. Don't tell people to go to the gym. Don't ask them, have you tried or tell them to relax? Just say, how can I be here for you? How do you need me to show up for you in this journey? What do you need? What can, how can I support you? Like if you want to support, ask them how they need it. A lot of times they'll just be like, you saying that means a lot. But yes. don't just tell them what you think is going to work because you don't know. You're not God. Exactly. Or their doctor. Give, yeah. give advice when it's asked for, but never Only. share unsolicited advice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's really that mm -hmm. simple. I think people feel like they have to fix. I mean, I've been in, in a previous <gasps> yes. life prior to my infertility journey. I mm -hmm. felt like I had to fix things too, right? Because there's got to be an yeah. answer. I you know, have to be mm -hmm. positive Pollyanna over here and help find the answer, the solution, because you know, at work, there's always an answer or solution, right. right? Why wouldn't there be in other people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And it was so humbling to go through infertility and realize there isn't a fix that I haven't right. already tried. Mm -hmm. And the only fix I need is the support and the community that says, I can't fix you, but I can be here to hold your hand when you ask me to. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, and what an amazing community too. I mean, we see it a lot. Like it's the worst club with the best members. I mean, I, you know, recently met one of the girls that I met online. Her name's Becca. Um, I love her. She had her transfer a day before I had mine and amen, both of our babies stuck. And this past week we actually met in person for the first time holding our babies in real life. And she had her transfer the day before me. She had her baby the day before me. Like it was all just so <sighs> magical, you know? And I had spoken to this person, this human being for over a year on a daily basis and had never FaceTimed, never seen her face, but I, I consider her someone that I would go to battle for. And, you know, you really do start to find so much strength in strangers. And I think that that's why, you know, even since back in the day being sober out loud or uh, recovering out loud, the whole purpose of that was to show people that they're not alone, that they're not this pariah, that they're not this person that just is, you know, given some bad circumstances and they have to like figure it out, you know, like bad things happen. Let's just... There's, there's people out there that have gone through exactly what you're going through. And I have no right to judge anybody. So I, I think I share my most salacious things and my most heartwarming things and my saddest points so that people just know that they're not alone in this journey. And there are people out there that are just like them and they're just perfect the way that they are. A thousand percent. Yeah. It's true. The community is incredible and uplifting. And I think there's a community for just about everything. Sometimes it's a little bit harder mm -hmm. to find social, yeah. although it can really get a bad rap at times, can be a really mm -hmm. great place to start when you're searching for a community. Yeah doesn't mean yeah. everybody needs to be a part of the community that you want to be a part of, but you can find really great gems mm -hmm. and yeah. to your point, feel less alone. And I love that you're mm -hmm. using your voice and you used your voice. You used your voice when you were recovering out loud. I mean, you really recovered mm -hmm. out loud. You recovered almost from day <laughs> one, like yeah. you, out loud from day one, right? You recovered from yeah. day one out loud and said, mm -hmm you really had no choice. It sounds like I didn't have a choice, but yes, but given that opportunity, I saw the value in just being 
unabashedly authentic. Um, I've been sober for 16 and a half years. <laughs> That's a long time. And I've been of service in that community for 16 and a half years. And I've been very transparent with my ups and downs and my ego deaths and my rebirths and spiritual awakenings and, you know, knowing, you know, newly diagnosed depression, anxiety, ADHD, like just willing to show everyone like, Hey man, I'm still on the journey. I'm still sober. I'm still healthy and I'm still learning. Right. And then when I started to go through infertility and I'm watching all of my closest friends get pregnant before me one time, two times. And I started trying before any of them. It was the most isolating experience that I had ever gone through. And it was just my next mountain. You know, like when you start to take care of yourself and you start to like decide, okay, I'm going to do this life thing authentically. And I'm going to try to be the best version of myself that I can. That doesn't omit us or prevent us from having bad experiences, right? There's always going to be an ebb and a flow to life, a yin and a yang. And frankly, my life had been pretty sweet <laughs> for a long time. Like my struggles were minimal. And then it was just my next battle. It was my next mountain. And I, I definitely, it was, a, a, you know, feeling like I didn't make the cheerleading squad. I'm sure you relate to that, but I mean, people that haven't gone through it, my God, they just don't know. <laughs> they they don't just don't get, get it. it. And it's not I mean, their even fault. Now, no, it's they not their fault. It. It's, they don't get it. And even now, like after I've successfully had a child, I'm being treated as if I'm fertile and they're like, so when are you having your next one? And I'm like, are you serious? Did you not just watch my experience for four years? Do you think that like I have magic eggs now all of a sudden that my endi endometriosis just cured that uh, I don't have anti-nuclear antibodies that are going to attack whatever my body decides to create? Like <laughs> it's a, I am a mad scientist. Like unless I'm going through a mad scientist experience, I highly doubt that I'm just, my body fixed itself and just knows what it's doing now. And we can all hope, right? Like we can all hope and we Amen. would love to believe that, right? Amen. But yes. And if Tara, it happens, thank you, God. Uh, oh, right? Yes. But I, I, under, I get this. I get this so mm -hmm. hard because I understand mm -hmm. that moment where you've, you've, you're coming down the other side of the mountain and it's usually mm -hmm. like a few months after and like, oh, you must be magically cured. They don't say that part. Right. When are you going yeah. to have your next? And then that, mm -hmm. that echoes and echoes and echoes. Yeah. And then, then it's like, well, do I, it's just like, I just got done experiencing all mm -hmm. of this. Let me be yeah. in bliss for at least a little for while Please. forever. Maybe <laughs> um, yeah. it, it's such a beautiful experience to just be a new mom. Yeah. Why not it let is. you just it's enjoy it? Yeah. And I, I wish I could say, you know, for those who are still in it, I really wish that I could say having a child Earthside changes the trauma that you went through. But every time still, if I hear a pregnancy announcement, it feels like a knife in my heart. I don't know why it's post-traumatic stress. I do know why it's post-traumatic stress disorder. It's just a new, it's coming at me from a different angle now. And I'm already grieving the loss of a child I may not ever have again. I don't get the luxury of being someone who can just plan, all right, I want to have a girl or maybe like two years later, have another child. And then that way that they're this many years apart and blah, 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 blah. I'm never going to have that. And so, you know, I am definitely, uh, it's also, I don't know if you experienced this, but I also feel out of place a little bit with the infertility community because I did have a child. And so now I don't know where I fit. I, I went don't know where this. I fit. Mm -hmm. I went through this and there will come a point where you're comfortable in it right now, right now, 
-hmm. You are a new mom. You're going through so much. I mean, your hormones are not even, your hormones are not at their normal state, right? Right. (laughs) You've got a lot going on. You're probably very Mm -hmm. sleep deprived. You have a lot going on in your mind. So I can relate to your feelings of, first of all, I just want to enjoy my baby. I still want to just enjoy my baby. I still Mm -hmm. get asked the question about when I'm going to have another kid or, oh my gosh, aren't you going to give your child another sibling, another, Mm -hmm. give them a sibling at all. And it's being so selfish that you're not giving Mm -hmm. your daughter a sibling. And I think, you know, you have no idea how hard it was to get to the first one. And and truth be right. told here, I may not. I, I very likely will not have another child. I'm pretty yeah. I'm pretty resolved. I still have my moments that I waffle. Mm-hmm. The other day I walked up of to my course. husband and I said, Hey, what do you think about <laughs> trying to figure out a second? And he just looked at me like I was insane. Because we have tried. Mm-hmm. Don't think that we haven't through medical right. intervention of and all course. the things. But going back to how you fit in the community for this is for anybody who's listening, who feels out of sorts after being in it and, and feeling like you're in the trenches, Mm -hmm. people like Tara and me exist. Mm -hmm. We went through the roller coaster of infertility, had a baby Mm -hmm. and we don't know whether we are necessarily resolved or not. Right. And all of a sudden we, we got our wish, but we mm-hmm. feel bad about the people we left behind. Yes. And at the Survivor's same time, guilt. and at the same time, it's like, what happens next? You know, these are not things right. that we should be thinking about, but I, I do want to share that there are other people like us. There is such a thing as motherhood after infertility. And yes. I think that's part of it. Maybe that's maybe that's something that I'll talk more about, you know, motherhood after infertility, because we have to use our voice. Yeah. We have to use our voice. And I think by using mm-hmm. our voice, we can remind others that we're not alone. We weren't alone yeah. before, and we're not alone mm-hmm. now. Right. So, Tara, you are not alone, I promise. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, mm-hmm. but even, uh, even on social media lately, like I'll, po- I'll post like, you know, she's this many months, she's this many months, like little milestones and here and there, but I, I just, right now I'm just in this bubble of like, I just want to be a mom and I just want to enjoy this while I can. And I also yes. don't even know what to say. Like right now I'm just too tired. <laughs> like that's why yes. it took me forever just to so be like, yes, post. this day I'll do it. Yeah. But I, don't um, post. but that is something that has come up. And I, I know that a lot of people have experienced the same thing. And I know, you know, hearing that you've gone through it, that's why we do this. Like, cause we're not alone. We're not people who uh, just have gone through this one experience by ourselves and no one knows what we're talking about. If you ever say that you're wrong, <laughs> like anyone who thinks that no one's gone through this, you're wrong. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a community after that community. And then, who knows what's going to be next, you know, like at this point in my life, like there's no guarantees. There's no, there's no really clear trajectory. Cause the second you think, you know, what's going to happen, boom, something else happens. I mean, thank God I didn't need to have a good attitude to get pregnant. You know what I mean? <laughs> like when I had my transfer, I was like, this is not going to work. I mean, you get <gasps> jaded after a while. You're like, Oh, that's cute. Everyone's like, baby dies. You're like, "Mm." (laughs) and then you could have floored me when I got a positive pregnancy test. And then I did not get excited about my pregnancy. That's something that you don't hear about a lot too, because you know, if you are in the infertility community and you do get pregnant, it's very hard to say out loud. I'm terrified that this child is going to die. I'm terrified that I'm going to lose this or complain about a symptom because people are like, you should just be grateful you're pregnant. It's like pregnancy can suck. Ah! It's like, a you can't win. You really can't <laughs> win. Um, but who knows? I'm just, I'm grateful to be in the space that I am today. And what I've learned through this process is that I'm far more capable and strong than I ever gave myself credit for ever. I would love to say that my scandal was the hardest thing that I ever went through, but it wasn't. It was my infertility. 
quick question for you about infertility. When you found out that you were suffering from infertility, which is also a disease, I don't think Mm -hmm. people realize that. Right. What went through your mind? Like what, what a bag of shit you were handed. You're like, I already went through my my adversity. What the hell? (laughs) Gosh. Well, and it was like during the pandemic, like I feel like the whole world was going to shit. Um, but I knew something was wrong. Like I, I knew that if you didn't have a baby within the first year, then you could possibly have infertility. And then my husband and I decided, well, let's try supplements. We'll do all the natural things that you can do. And then if that doesn't work after two years, then we'll, you know, dance with the idea of looking to an infertility doctor. And I'm telling you that phone is a thousand pounds before you pick it up and call. And I had, I mean, if it wasn't for my best friend, my wife, I call her my wife, but she's just like my wife, life partner, my best friend. Um, If it wasn't for her pulling up SCRC Beverly Hills um, on Google and hitting call, I never would have made that phone call because my fear of the unknown was stopping me from getting into action. So, you know, I do believe that we have angels amongst us. And sometimes I feel like God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And I was put in the position to get a diagnosis, you know, and, you know, it did feel like I was being handed a shit sandwich. I was 35, 30, 35, I think, being told that I had the egg quality of like a 42 year old that, you know, it's hard. I had diminished ovarian reserve, like my eggs were dusty. I call them dusty ass eggs. Um, that I didn't have many follicles, you know, I, they were like, you see those chips? Those are, that's, they look like chocolate chips. Those are follicles. And you start to learn all of these new words. And you, I could be an ultrasound tech at this point. Cause I've had so many dances <laughs> with Wanda and I, I, you could have knocked me over, but, and then going through it, finding out, Oh wow. You also have endometriosis. Like I did, um, the uh, receptivity test and ERA and my, my doctor, um, Dr. Lena Copians from Southern California reproductive health. She suggested since I only had one healthy embryo that I would do all of the testing for like, you know, timing and the best time to uh, implant and, or do the transfer and whatnot, um, just to make sure there's no underlying uh, infections. I had to do a hysteroscopy because Apparently, I cannot handle any type of anything going into my uterus without passing out from pain. It's another thing. I've gone through more painful procedures. No woman should have to go through any of this awake, period. No. Period. I have passed out from pain on tables more often than I can count from Oof. simple procedures that shouldn't hurt that bad. But this isn't, you know, people usually can get through this and it's like, I, my blood pressure just bottomed out and I'm begging you to take me to the hospital because I feel like I'm dying. Girl, I'm just, I'm literally going through all of it in my head. I know this is a very long answer to a very short question, but I mean, I feel like this roller coaster is just now starting to slow down a little bit and I'm exhausted. (laughs) It's, It's insane. I felt like, damn, why me? Why do I have to go through this? I understand because I felt the exact same thing, but then I went back Mm -hmm. in my head thinking, wow, what did I do wrong? I don't know if you had those feelings of like, what is this payback for all of the things that I did? Anyway, um, Mm -hmm. speaking of pain, I I do want to Mm -hmm. ask you about your near-death experience during childbirth. (gasps) Now, you share that that's something people don't really know, and I saw some stories that sort of alluded Mm -hmm. to something being wrong. I, I didn't want to ask you, I wanted to just be there Mm -hmm. because I thought whatever happened seems really hard and is Tara Mm -hmm. okay. But you alluded to this near death childbirth experience. Yep. What happened and what would you tell moms that are pregnant and about to Mm -hmm. give birth? What should they know? So a couple of things, my pregnancy was a breeze up until 
literally November the 1st. I wasn't due until December, uh, what was my due date? December 31st. I don't even remember at this point, but it, you literally flush it. It's amazing how quickly you flush things. But November the 1st, I'm noticing that I'm having contractions. Um, I still have two months to go, two full months to go. And I decided to start counting them. And I realized that they were like three minutes apart. And I was like, wow, I guess I should go to the hospital because, and I am seeing my stomach contract. Like it's not Braxton Hicks. It's like, these are contractions. And so I go to the hospital and before I know it, I'm being admitted to the high risk unit. And um, they're wanting to give me steroids so that the baby's lungs can develop quickly enough for premature birth. And I'm like, what is going on? And so they were able to arrest my labor. Um, I was on a magnesium drip for days. It's the worst feeling in the world. I, I know that people have gone through that. It is just awful. It's an awful feeling. Um, I still continued to contract, but I wasn't dilating. So after a week and a half and being, after being hospitalized with contractions, they sent me home. I had contractions for two months, two months straight. And oh my gosh, that's awful. I'm sorry. Awful. I didn't mean to just like outburst with that, but that sounds so painful. <laughs> and then people are also, like, how would you know? Possible. I but mean, how would you know when I you're just, supposed to get, I mean, but how right, would you because know what but every, like when you're supposed to give birth, Right. I'm like, sorry, I, every, I know it was it, as, as mind blowing as it is for you. The frustration was very real for me because I'm being told you're going to go into labor early. You're, we're pretty sure you're going to go into labor early. We're going to put, we're going to try to stop your labor because, oh God. Right. And I'm watching my contractions on the monitor the day that they're discharging me to go home and they're still five minutes apart. And I'm like, so when do I come, when do I come back? And they're like, when they get to like three minutes apart, I'm like the next day I had to go back because they were three minutes apart. And so every time that I went for an NST test or like the non-stress test or whatever, a nurse would be like, wow, you're having significant contractions. I'm like, you think? <laughs> and they just kept happening. And, and I didn't know anyone, like I had one person that hit me up on Instagram say, I went through the exact same thing. And you would think that when I actually, that I was just going to go into labor and I was, my water was going to break and that would be it. No, no. We had to induce. Oh my God. And then I'm, I know I was, I, they, they planned an induction. Cause I can tell you after two months of that, you're done. You're like, you know what? Let's get this thing over with. Like, stop trying to slow this down. Let's put some Pitocin in there and crank it up a little. You know, like I was ready to get her out. Um, not because I hated being pregnant. I loved it. I just was concerned about the safety of my daughter. And I go in for the induction. They give me something to soften my uterus or my cervix. N nothing really happens. Then they kick it up with Pitocin. Nothing happens. I labored for 24 hours. My cervix was not dilating. And I, I just knew, I knew in my heart that I was going to end up having to have a C-section. My doctor tried to break my water three different times and couldn't do it successfully. And I felt it after an epidural. And I'm telling them like, hey guys, I can feel the right side of my body. Like my left <sighs> leg was just my right. I was like oh doing this. Gosh. Like, is this normal? <laughs> and so... After the second attempt and him going to try to put a Foley balloon, I was like, absolutely not. Cut her out. <laughs> like, I was like, let's just, you know, come on. So I go into uh, the operating room for a C-section and I'm telling the doctors, I can still feel the right side of my body. Guys, I can still feel the right side of my body. And at this point, I had been given so many drugs just to... A, get the epidural to work, and then B, there's fentanyl in that. Um, and, you know, being a, a previous opioid addict, like, I know when I've had a lot, you know. So I, I had plenty of drugs in my system. And I'm getting sick from the amount of uh, opioids in my system. So I'm, like, throwing up, which I think is pretty normal. It's like nerves and, you know, whatever else. But I still could feel the pinch. And I, at one point, was just begging the doctor, like, just put me under. Like, please, just put me under general anesthesia. Just knock me out. 
And I wasn't given general anesthesia. I was given, um, I think they shot me up with ketamine is what it was. And I literally (sighs) felt my soul leave my body and people can believe this if they want or not. I know my experience and I also am a former drug addict. I know what a trip is and what a trip isn't. (laughs) So I feel my drug or I feel my soul leave my body enough to where my consciousness said, wow, this is how I die. Like I just died. And I remember that um, the best way I can describe it is the Thor bridge, like to go into uh, Asgard, (laughs) the colorful bridge. I feel like I went through a tunnel with those colors and it was like square. And I started hearing like, like, I don't know. It was a very strange sound, but I lost all sense of Oh my God. Emotion. I lost all sense of physical pain. Like everything that made me a human being in this meat suit was gone. And all I was, was this floating consciousness. And I remember thinking, wow, I just died. Like, this is how I died. Huh? And it was just very matter of fact. And I'm going through all of these different, like colorful dimensions, I'm guessing, because I don't know what the word is, you know? And I end up, um, I started hearing my husband's voice saying, she's here. You're okay. Everything's okay. I love you so much. You're so strong. You're so powerful. I'm right here beside you. And then my spirit was like, oh yeah, I'll never find another Eli. (laughs) Like, and then I thought, wow, I need to go grab my daughter. I swear. I went to some other dimension, grabbed ZZ. And the closer I got to my physical body, I started to feel human emotion again. And then as I started going through that vortex or whatever it was, um, the closer I got to my body, the more pain I started feeling. And I came to going, ow, 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 like screaming because I I I felt the physical pain because I came out of it or came back to it, I guess. But I I was, I'm different. There's something about that experience that has just, made me different. Um, and I know this sounds so weird, but even like for the, f- the next few days in my peripheral vision, I could see those lights that I saw like in that tunnel as if they were still there. And I was not on any drug that would make me hallucinate that. Um, but I remember feeling um, like, wow, I just, I just want to live my life Like I, I'm not going to be here tomorrow because I have such a beautiful, such a beautiful existence and so much fullness that I just want to experience it. I don't want to miss it. I, 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 it's true. I may never, ever find another Eli. I love my husband. He's just, we're, he's my best friend. Like we love and respect. Like it's crazy to hear people say, I really like my husband, (laughs) you know, like, He's a joy and my daughter is out of this world. I mean, she is, she's been here before. Like, I don't know. I, I, I just, she's, she's evolved. Um, but every day now, like, I just feel different. I love harder. I'm more present. Um, I'm filled with gratitude on a daily basis. I have more patience than I thought I was ever going to be capable of. Um, for everyone. I am the emotional support animal in my home for everyone. I've got three dogs, a husband and a baby and they all need me. Um, but God, I'm just so grateful to be able to fill those shoes. What an experience that was. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that. Chills, chills, chills. That was so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was intense. I feel like I was there with you. Yeah. And wow. And, and as you're talking about it, I'm thinking it wasn't your time, right? It wasn't your time. Yeah. And ZZ chose you just as much uh-huh. as you chose her. And she was like, uh-huh. you're still here. You're staying here with me. You're sticking it out, mama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was really, really powerful. Yeah. Whew. It's crazy. Yeah. It's pretty I mean, wild. Even my, my mom at one point, cause she was in the room as well. She, was terrified. She said, you just looked like you were gone. Like there was a very real moment where she thought she was going to lose both of her girls. Cause ZZ had a hard time. Like she was not catching her breath. She, you know, like when you think you're going to hear the wah, wah, with her, it was, "Ah." and then silence. Wow. Ah. That's so scary. It, It was so scary. Um, 
But there's a really fun video of me on my Instagram where I came to when I was really high. If you guys want to watch it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's pretty I might have to upload that. I'll upload that into stories with this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you can share You're that welcome. with me. Tara, thank you so much for sharing so much of your heart and soul yeah. with me, with our listeners today. It means the world. Thanks for having me. Ditto. Ditto.